Uh, if you're listening on Zoom, we are just uh, about ready to get started. Pull the trigger as soon as Dave gives me the word. We are gathered for the AAAP final meeting of 2022, the first time we've gotten together in person here tonight at the State Museum Planetarium in Trenton. And we're thrilled to be here. Some of you members are out there in the ether world. I see 19 participants are online as well. So we've got a nice gathering tonight. Let's hope this is a symbol of things to come. Let me see if I can get rolling here. Here's the plan for the evening. I have a few announcements. I think. One who may not need that much introduction. He's pretty famous around these parts, but I'll leave that for a moment. And just to remind that then the Zoomers will see the virtual sky for June. It's actually produced by Bill and the Planetarium staff. It's, it's, a, it's a canned version of what we're going to see live tonight. Bill's going to go into a sky tour. So the Zoomers will see the virtual sky tour. And then when that concludes, the Zooming will actually end and the YouTube recording will end because we're not, because of copyright questions, we're not able to show the main presentation on the dome through our Zoom. So understand that those of you members who are out on Zoom right now, that it will end after that. But we'll hang out here and we'll go through the main thing and we'll have the chance to uh, have a little more conversation after the lights come back up and the show is over. My uh, voice will be over also, but you guys are more than welcome to mill around. As I understand it from Bill, we can hang around here till maybe just a little bit before 10. Although I suspect we'll be out of here well before that, but there's no rush to get out to have conversation with your fellows. Well, here we go. So, uh, yeah, so what's going on? If I can get my computer to work. Yeah, what about space news then? I always like to share a little space news with you guys. What's been happening? Well, Have a 60th anniversary of history. That's pretty neat. And there's some information on our website that Brad Book Club was, was up to back in. I guess we got to stand over here. Thank you. The history of the club runs fairly deep, and there is a nice write up of at least the first 15 years or so on our website. And I urge you to take a look at it because as we start to approach 60, this fall, remember, will be the official date. Um, there is nobody in the club today who's a member of the NDS group. We've had a general turn. I don't like quite a major, but some of it's a lot of them. We can bring in Dyson to our last thing now. <laughs> so um, there's going to be some, uh, some desire on our part this fall to maybe make a more appropriate celebration than we've been able to during the time. Of COVID. Um, and so we don't know quite how things are going to be shaped out, but if, if we have good fortune and the number of ways, we'd like to get back to a, a normal uh, meeting in the flesh arrangement as well. So, in a way, tonight's session is a, a hybrid meeting with respect to the system to see if we can really do this as a hybrid. Uh, nonetheless, we don't want to stay in the world of Zoom forever. We need to 
love to get back to a real auditorium on a monthly basis. And the great history of the club going way back to 1962 is to do that once a month. And we have some phenomenal speakers through the years. In fact, the first and big ones in the last couple, but we really have a history of phenomenal speakers all the way back. And so I'll just say um, there's some systemic problems in getting back to the hall on the campus. Um, your AAA board members will be discussing this this summer, uh, trying to come up with a, a workable solution that doesn't work for us. And I don't need to get into details, but there's reasons it may not work out for us. I mean, there's a lot of massive concerns on the campus. Um, we have one iron in the fire that I'll just go ahead and say it. There's our own members. So this is not, this one is not. Maybe it's but um, we're working on having access to the Institute for Advanced Study, IAS, and Princeton. The auditorium there is tailor-made for our needs. So if we can pull that off, that will become our home for a while, and we'll see how well it goes. Some of you remember being there at the 50th if you will, the celebration many years ago, nine years ago, and uh, it was just an absolutely splendid venue. So we'll see how that goes. We'll keep you posted. We'll be working on that this summer and we'll try to come up with something where when September rolls around, we'll have a real meeting place. So stay tuned to that. Also, some space news. No. Yeah. So, <laughs> that was a big deal. It was a big deal to uh, see the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And um, it's stimulating to see so many new research projects begin to bear fruit. Things that have been projects going for years and years and decades are beginning to play out. And another one that just came up in the news yesterday, uh, something caught my eye, and that was um, the ESA's Gaia mission announcing a new data release with new information, spectral information, brightness, composition, and especially motion through space for 1.8 billion stars. And that's a shocking thing to see. If you paid attention to the Gaia mission, it's a game changer in terms of mapping out the heavens and finding where things really are, especially from a three-dimensional sense. And this is one of the more vexing things for us as amateur astronomers when we see things out in the sky. It's so difficult to know exactly where they are, uh, especially in a three-dimensional sense. Also would point out that as phenomenal as this is, that represents only 1.8 billion stars represents only maybe 2% of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, which is a little mind boggling. So it shows you the state of progress of humanity. If we are ever truly going to build gateways to the stars, then having a really, really accurate map is essential. And so the Gaia mission is really all about ast astrometry. And it, its goal is to make a three-dimensional map of the motions and positions and a consistent coordinate system of all the celestial bodies, or at least that 1.8 billion of them that the present data set represents. And you might remember Hipparchos, uh, the existing best map of the galaxy and, and its contents came from the Hipparchos satellite. Uh, way back in the 90s, and Gaia began its nominal operations in 2014. We didn't hear so much about this here in the States because it's an ESA thing, but make no mistake, ESA is every bit as cutting edge as NASA is, as witnessed by who was responsible for the launch of the web just a couple of months ago. You guys were all tuned into that. That was ESA at work. Well, so Gaia is able to measure the combined effect of parallax and proper motion on stars and other celestial objects. The parallax repeats every year while proper motion of a star is a linear continual thing depending on its velocity. So a few years of observation by Gaia and its very sophisticated camera and telescope system allows separating out parallax from proper motion. And that's the significance of this. They've been able to do all of the things included on this slide. And that is not only the mapping of the positions of those 1.8 billion stars, but understand how many of them are binaries um, to classify objects into their correct category, including things like planetary nebulas, um, variable stars, 
uh, they've able, been able to do a form of spectroscopy by using uh, a variety of filters on the CCD cameras on the space telescope. They're able to do the equivalent of spectroscopy. So now you have all this data coming together and it's a game changer. Some of this information is also making its way into mainstream uh, astronomy programs like the planetarium program we use the AAAP Observatory, the Sky 10, is able to now upload Gaia data, or at least a subset of that 1.8 billion stars, because that is a lot for the memory of that computer. This is the last image I'll show you on the Gaia story, but this shows something remarkable for the first time. It looks a little bit like some other maps you've seen of the sky. That's the plane of the Milky Way, that middle band the entire Milky Way and the density or the brightness of the, the optical density, if you will, the brightness is the density of the matter that's being picked up. And what's remarkable about this is all those streaks, those lines are the actual trajectory of the stars that have been mapped by Gaia in the next 400,000 years showing their proper motion with respect to the plane of the galaxy. Our local region of the galaxy, and that's within 320 light years of us, the, all those streaks are the nearby stars and their proper motions. And it's just mind blowing to realize how dynamic and vibrating and in motion our little pocket of the galaxy is. So those represent all the foreground stars with the plane of the Milky Way behind it. Truly a breakthrough in our understanding of the three dimensionality of the region of space around us. So of course I couldn't resist putting up a few astrophotography slides here because it gets at the question of where are these things in space? And I'm sure Bill is gonna educate us a bit when he gets into the sky tour and we'll see some things in the summer sky. I'm gonna show you three globular clusters that are well positioned right now. Probably Bill will show them, but I'm just showing you the output of a 12 inch telescope from New Jersey a couple of weeks ago. I took advantage of the three or four nights of clear sky that we had without a big moon to photograph these. And they both, all three of these images represent an equal exposure time under as close to identical conditions as I could get. And watch for the differences. So Messier 3, M3 and Boötes, one of the fabulous globular clusters many of us have seen. And you might see even this Friday, if you guys go out to the observatory, it's supposed to be clear this Friday night, about 34,000 light years away for M3. And it looks, Similar, but a little bit different in shape. Here is Messier 13, 23,000 light years away. And here's Messier 92, 26,000 light years away. And where these things are located in our galaxy, nothing as sophisticated as a, uh, a Gaia map, but a program that I like to use called Where is M13? I've showed you this before. It's kind of a cool thing because, whoops, they don't want to do that. It's showing you where these objects are. So this is us, here's Earth or the sun. Oh, you know what, my, my pointer won't show. Did we have that laser pointer? Yeah. Where are we on Zoom? Oh. Yeah, Hold on, we got a little technical issue. Let me just stop and share again to our Zoomers. Is that working now? Are you seeing the globular in Zoom? Sorry, I'm getting a little feedback yep. from yes. our technical crew here. Mm -hmm. All right. Like I say, we're rusty. All right. All I really wanted to show you was M3. Here's Earth and the sun, and here's M3. And the distance between these three globulars, if we're here in the plane, here they are up here. And they here's the closest, and here's the other two. It's a little hard to see this, I realize, on the dome. But the idea is three dimensionality. So what might seem closest when you look across the X coordinate is quite distant when you look across the Y coordinate. And that explains the differences in distances and indeed on the brightness and the diameter of these objects. So M3, M13 and M92 make a great 
case example of understanding three-dimensional location in the galaxy when you peer at them through the eyepiece of a telescope and you see somewhat similar globular clusters and you realize that M3 is in fact a great deal farther away because it lies more out of the plane of the Milky Way is an interesting thing and something we can think more about and maybe use this program out at the observatory at times because it does show most of the NGCs and all the Messier objects in terms of where they are in space. Well, so what about these globular clusters? They're amazing things. And I just wanted to show one more. This is actually an astrophoto from the Chilean telescope I'm part of. And it's probably the best you could, I could hope to ever do in terms of resolution and the incredible detail in these globular clusters. This is taken with a 24 inch telescope at 5,000 feet elevation. So the same kind of idea, this is in Sagittarius. So it's something that we could see later this summer, Messier 22. Well, I've also become really interested and in, some of you share this interest. I know Dave has been fascinated by these objects that we can pick up with our video cameras for the big telescopes. This is a planetary nebula, sometimes called the Medusa. And I couldn't resist showing it because honestly, I wanted to see how it looked on the big screen here. And it's very faint. It's an able planetary. The ables are all magnitude 12 or fainter. So it's not like the ring and some of these others you can see visually. In fact, you can't see this through an eyepiece even with a new moon. And yet we can pick it up with our astro video cameras. And this is, this is several nights of exposure, quite a few hours, but you can see amazing colors and the reality of the colors and how they map to the chemistry. I won't get into that now, but it's one of the most, um, let's say thrilling features of being able to do planetary nebula with the hardware. A couple of other examples, this one from Chile, but this one has been seldom seen and seldom photographed. And if when I look on the internet, it had actually been published. So this is a rare beast indeed, Abel Planetary Nebula number 35 in Hydra, a Southern constellation far South. And you can see the mysterious separation of the colors here and even a, a wind, a shock, like a, a, a bow shock wave there in the middle where the blue is concentrated. And it has to do with a lot of ionized gas being shaped by stellar winds coming off the central uh, white dwarf. Um, wish we could talk about that more. Of course, colors don't always render true and I'm seeing a lot more color on my screen, but just keep in mind, if you look these things up, um, you know, the colors really are telling you about the chemistry, the type of gases that has created the fluorescent image that you see. Another one from the Southern Sky, Able Planetary 7. And one more, a really, really, really faint one, a uh, ghostly image, mostly hydrogen, uh, ionized hydrogen gas here glowing spookily in red. And finally, an emission nebula, why not? Let's take a look at a couple of other types of objects before we move on. An emission nebula where stars are forming just incredible depth of color and contrast in these objects. A galaxy, this is a New Jersey shot from my backyard, uh, Messier 63, incredible levels of contrast, especially if you look at this region here where there are dark lanes in the outer matter that ri rise outside the, the spiral structure itself. 27 million light years away, a thousand times farther than those planetaries. Okay, so I think that what I want to do now is bring us up to a quick view of a trailer. And this is all experimental work. So let's see if we can do this. This is a teaser for things to come tonight. And if I can do it, I'm going to do it by bringing the Zoom meeting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's not a, something I want to see. All right, here we go. Let's try this. Fingers crossed. High fidelity sound. Hold on. Sorry. Pretty tough to do this. Oh, 
Oh, let's try it again. No. Hold on. We're learning as we go. That might be better. No, it won't. Hold on. Just going to close that. There we go. Scan to your Rex. Here, let's try that. That's better. Okay. Trial by danger, I guess. Okay, here we go. Yeah, you'll need to you'll need to stay close to your laptop. Right. Well, okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We're back to real time here. And uh, this has been an interesting spring and summer season. We've had some attempts to get folks out there in the uh, observatory and daytime sessions and member events. And the weather just hasn't really uh, co cooperated with us very well. So we won't stop trying, but I think it would be good uh, if we took it upon ourselves to just get out there to the observatory on Friday nights when there are public nights, rather than trying to schedule something coming up, which is really just proven difficult for us. If, if we just say, you know what, members are doubly welcome to come out on Friday nights. It's a chance to get to know each other better. Yeah, they're public out there, but honestly, the key holders can handle it and we can maybe stay later than the public can anyway, because we have stamina. And uh, so I don't think we're going to plan any more member events over the next month or two. Like I say, the weather's just been too difficult. Maybe 
as the summer wears on and we start getting some really good clear sessions, we might work something out. So that's sort of where it stands. We wanted to have the opportunity to meet with everybody, to talk about telescopes, to talk about hardware, get a chance for folks to ask questions, maybe learn how to use equipment that's been sitting in your basement for a while. We're still keen to do that. And the Friday night sessions are absolutely appropriate to do that. And I'm sure Dave will agree with me there to, if you wanna do that, you can send a note in advance or just show up with your hardware and ask the key holders that are there that night, you know, any questions you may have. So that's just something we're trying to do to get members back together as we break out of the weirdness of the last two years and, and go forward in time. I know there's been a, a lot happening on the membership front, uh, for example. Um, during the time of COVID, the last few years, our membership roster has increased. It has not decreased at all. In fact, our secretary has been, uh, Secretary Jean Allen has been doing a, a, a yeoman's job of reorganizing the whole record keeping and making it more trackable and user friendly for himself as well as for members. Jean, are you here? Because I don't know that I saw you. Where are you, Jean? Hi, Jean. Yeah, so what is the count looking like these days as far as our membership role? The zoom, the zoom might pick it up. Yeah, in fact, that's about twice the membership of we had in 2019 or so. So that's great to hear. I think one of our difficulties, though, as, as, as I've been saying, is getting people together. You know, our membership has gone up, but half of our memberships have probably never met each other. So, you know, we're working on that and everybody's got to make some effort if that's going to happen. I'm great to have this turnout here tonight. And let's just say this is the start of, of things to come. I'm getting a little feedback again. OK. Yeah. So. Thanks, Gene. Yeah, it's been it's been great to see that. And there is every reason to expect it to continue. So. It's been a bit of a challenge getting things organized to this point, but as I said, Gene has got things where the membership and the ability to renew and all those things are now being taken care of a much more efficient way. So thanks for that. Yeah, so um, actually I want to ask Michael, our treasurer, maybe Gene, you can hand him the microphone there, but um, since we haven't really talked about this for a little while, things are looking on the... Um, on the financial front, uh, Michael Matrano, our treasurer, just give us a quick update if you would, please, Michael. Oh, really nothing to update yeah. yet, right? But nothing really new uh, over the last month from the state permitting process. We think we've done all of our homework, but they haven't.
all of which is describing the plan to rebuild the, the structures that hold up the rollout roof at the observatory. So that's still on hold and you know we're doing everything we can and Michael has done a great job with it. Unfortunately, the state has done a woeful job. I shouldn't say that since we're in a state structure right now, but we're, we're hoping, <laughs> hoping that they will come through for us. And so we're working behind the scenes there, but, the, but that's by way of saying the observatory is really clicking. And Dave, I don't know if you wanna say a few words about how you see things from the seat of the observatory chair person. Got it. As soon as I unmute, okay, yeah. I can stop sharing. Sure. Okay, so um, let me turn this back on me so people can at least. Um, we've had some good turnout uh, at our public nights when we're open. Sorry, um, I want to at least stay within my camera view. A um, couple of things are going on. Um, um, we, oh, we had a great turnout for our solar observing on Memorial Day weekend. That was on, uh, I guess it was a Saturday. I forget what day we did it. We had probably 75 people there. We had um, like nine or eight or nine setups for solar observing. Uh, lots of people, lots of questions, lots of fun. Uh, Victor did a great job with his um, walking through the solar system uh, that was stretched out along the road. Uh, he had the planets on um, on pins and and on uh, on stakes and and information about the planets uh, all laid out um, uh, in that on the, along the road. Uh, what else? What else is going on? Um, I've been in training. I've been doing two tra uh, two training sessions lately. Uh, I've been broadcasting to all membership. If you're interested, um, they kind of come up. You know, I look at the weather and I look at my availability. I know it is kind of short notice, but that's really the only way we can operate with this crappy weather in New Jersey. Um, we don't need perfect weather, but we need at least something to be able to see so we can slew around the sky. But we've been doing good on that. Uh, the other big issue that I've been working on is automating the roof. Um, Tom Swords and I were out there. We did a test run of some equipment that I cobbled together just enough to make sure that I wasn't going to break anything by trying to automate it. So um, I'm now in the process of putting that uh, all of those pieces together in a final package. And um, so that's been that's been I'm hoping by the end of the summer to have that totally automated um, with backup with backup manual backup. <laughs> I know that's been a question. Um, that's it pretty much on the observatory front. I, I am still looking for someone, if someone is interested in um, taking on a very small project, basically just contacting a carpet, you know, someone who would, uh, could install a carpet uh, for us. Um, you know, I got some ideas of what I wanna do. I, it's just another project that I'd like to, you know, hand out, have someone get involved with. So. Contact me, observatory at princetonastronomy.org, and uh, we'll go from there. So do any other uh, of you in the live audience have any questions or thoughts or ideas you want to share? Actually, yeah, just a uh, reminder. Hey, Dave. I know this... Tom Swords mentioned something, but we'll, look, we'll let some other people go first. But he, he has an idea for an outreach. All right. Any thoughts to share? Any questions about what's going on? What you want to see that you haven't seen? Lucky dog. Where's Tom? How about you, Tom? Tell us what's going. What your ideas, please. Um, some optimal days start on the 25th and 26th, 25th or Saturday and Sunday. <coughs> and 
Um, hope you're able to see uh, from the right now Mercury, Venus, Uranus, Mars, Jupiter, Neptune, and Saturn all at the same time. So some of the some of the some of the challenges they came up with just you know the fact you know um, a third of these planets conjunction with the moon. Like what the moon, I think. About 3.30. Yeah, yeah right. Exactly. <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're laughing a little bit about this, but... Morning. Yeah, we've got a question here. Joanna. Okay, so it's not what it to be.
So again, this sort out. The whole discourse thing, and I can't find the exam, I know what it is, but can you explain to me what the purpose of it is, the way and how we're using it? We could use it, not use it, 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 use and we're hoping folks will use it as a way to share their interest in astronomy if a live event is going to happen, especially maybe with only a few hours of mass morning, that's a place to wrap an announcement. The other thing is there's a couple of sub channels in there to have subgroups, if you will, um, where we're sharing out the topography. So basically announcements, activities, and that's the topography. It's all about communication. And by having a moderated chat app, you can say that there's really few competitors that will as well. Well, because because we have to have an invitation to join us, we have to keep security on it. We have to do this from time to time, so we'll reissue and invite and send it around to members via the emailer program that we have. Right, Len? <laughs> It's slightly cumbersome, but this is the way to maintain security. We talked about hats, and uh, so this is one very secure thing. And one is the reason we want it to remain that way. So we keep keeping on making these things all. It's all the same thing. I mean, that's only a small. One of the problems with this is the value of that. Yeah, so I guess we're getting along here. Are there any more comments before we roll into the main? <laughs> And, uh, I think we could view the mic, which is currently live. So I'm introducing now our program director, Davis, and he's going to uh, tell us everything we wanted to know about the nice speaker, if you will. Have a lot of new members. I've been getting uh, curiosity now. The Mike Toronto sharing with me some of the new members we've been getting. A few people have an interest in uh, contributing to the program. Uh, the function is to recruit guest speakers for our uh, We do not have a formal process for doing this. We don't have the periodic. Sessions or whatever, but it's an informal um, gathering really for some people who occasionally will contact me either by email or text message or phone. I welcome suggestions. Um, we have people who regularly give me suggestions or comments or I will pull in but um, I know that in common with many clubs, the AAAD has a sort of 80 20 principle, which is 20% of the people who make the kind of the work. And especially if you're a new person, intimidating uh, to you know, participate in some of the things that you might propose, and to bring some skill or knowledge. And I think that's not a standard that I really want to dispel. Fully possible. 
activity of the activity of the activity. I'm going to try to go back here so I can read this. One of my pleasures to each meeting is to introduce the topic and the speaker. Tonight's topic, if you will, of planetary shows called Touch the Stars. Uh, the school zone planetarium show dramatically showcases the robotic spacecraft used in the exploration of our solar system and the galaxy beyond. <laughs> the Haven traces the timeline of space through the history of masses, probes, orbiters, and lanterns from the heart of our solar system and the surfaces of the planets and moons to the grand tour of the Voyager spacecraft. The other planet is on the interstellar space. Um, our member, uh, Bill Murray, is going to put the planetarium on through its cases. This is an ultra high resolution video projection system. We uh, have the pleasure of experiencing it tonight. As uh, Rex mentioned, due to copyright restrictions, only those of us who are in the dome will be able to experience the, uh, the presentation. So, uh, a few words about Bill. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Bill Murray is a very small time and very active member of our club. He's been an astronomer astronomer for more than 50 years. He's been employed as a software engineer, physics and mathematics teacher. Currently, planetarium technician and lecturer at the New Jersey State Planetarium in Trenton. He's known more than a dozen different telescopes and is the past observatory chair, secretary, program chair, assistant director, and director of the Amateur Astronomers Association of Trenton. So he's got to be all the rest of us. John gets a thesis throughout his career. Um, he observed the night skies, dabbled in uh, electronic research and astronomy with 130 millimeter astrophysics APO refractors in his backyard observatory. So, and a special thanks to Bill for doing this tonight, as he's done for the last two years, <laughs> every, every June. So, Bill Murray. Thank you, Nick. everyone to the planetarium of the New Jersey State Museum. As Victor said, my name is Bill Murray. I'm employed here in the planetarium. Currently, I am the only full-time administrator. And uh, just to give you a little bit of uh, background on me, as Victor said, I've been the manager of the monitor for more than 50 years. So at this point, and our... a long time number of the uh, And uh, so, uh, for those of you who are, this is your first time here in the planetarium, welcome. Uh, the planetarium uh, was actually built here in Trenton along the state museum in 1954. And we've been doing uh, public astronomy programs here since then. And uh, back in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, the assistant curator of the planetarium was a gentleman named who was also a former director of AAA Day. Um, so the uh, uh, connection between the planetarium and the museum uh, for he is a long one. And it was actually the gentleman who hired me as my assistant started working here in 1997 as a part-time presenter. And his successor, Jake Forrest, uh, who is my boss, uh, hired me for a full-time position here in the planetarium back seven years ago. So I had the enviable position of getting paid. Uh, so, for those of you who have been here before, welcome back. As you know, along with the rest of the world, uh, we closed down due to COVID in March of 2020. And in March of 2020, July of 2021, I was only in the museum sporadically a few times. Uh, and then finally, we reopened the public that summer. Uh, for summer shows in the latter half of July and August. And then in September, we closed down again. And as you can tell, the way the planetarium used to look was too wide. Uh, for those of you who have been here before, we dedicated to the museum and also planetarium to the center of the jump, which is now history. 
Circuit Bear. Welcome to the June edition of Sky Views, brought to you by the New Jersey State Museum Planetarium. I'm Bill Murray, Planetarium Technician at the Planetarium. Let's take a look at some interesting sites visible in our June skies this year. Currently looking south on the evening of June 21st, the summer solstice. It is about 10.35 p.m., the end of astronomical twilight. So now about two hours after the sunset, around 8.30, the last bit of twilight has faded from the skies. The summer solstice is one of the four cardinal positions that the Earth occupies in its orbit around the sun. Uh, at this time of year, the northern hemisphere, where we are here in New Jersey, is tipped most uh, strongly towards the sun. Um, the Earth's axis is tipped at an angle of about 23 degrees from the vertical. And so during the summer, uh, north is tipped towards the sun. During the winter, south is. And uh, these are the longest days and shortest nights of the year, which is great if you enjoy outdoor activities like uh, swimming or going to the beach, uh, but not particularly great if you are an astronomer because there's only a very few hours of true darkness at this time of year, only about five or so around midnight, um, where the other hours of the day are either daylight or twilight is lighting up the sky. We're currently looking towards the south in our late evening skies here. We can see in the eastern sky the Milky Way beginning to rise. Summer is actually the best time of year to see the Milky Way if you can get out into dark skies away from the city lights. And we also see a couple of the constellations of the zodiac. Towards the south, we have the constellation of Scorpius with its bright star Antares. And to the right of Scorpius is the much dimmer constellation of Libra the Scales. But above them is a constellation that's larger than both of them put together and uh, not many people know about. And that's the constellation of Ophiuchus, the serpent bear. Ophiuchus is the Roman version of the Greek god Asclepius, who is the god of medicine. And he has an interesting story behind him. So uh, Asclepius in Greek mythology was a very renowned doctor. And one day he was called to minister to the son of the king of Crete, uh, who had been in a boating accident. And uh, uh, the boy had drowned and Asclepius was called in to see what he could do, realizing that the boy was dead and trying to think up a way to do something uh, while the king waited for him. And at that point, two snakes crawled into the room with Asclepius and the, uh, the dead prince. And uh, Asclepius took his staff, which he was holding, and bopped one of the snakes on the head, killing it. And immediately the other snake crawled off and found a sprig of plant which it brought back and dropped on its dead companion, which is immediately revived. And realizing this, Ophiuchus took his staff and shooed both snakes away, took the uh, sprig of plant, which may have been mistletoe, and placed it on the body of the dead prince who was immediately revived and brought back to life. Uh, after this, his fame increased greatly. Uh, and he was called upon in many quarters to repeat this trick. 
And eventually, uh, the god Hades, who was the god of the underworld in Greek mythology, uh, realizes that the, the flow of deceased souls into Hades uh, was decreasing rapidly and went to his brother, Zeus, who was the king of the gods, and said, you have to do something about this, otherwise I'm going to be out of a job. And so Zeus took Asclepius and uh, turned him into a constellation in the nighttime sky. And so he wouldn't get into mischief up there. He, uh, he took uh, one of the snakes and wrapped it around him so that would keep him busy. And so now we see in our evening skies the constellation of Ophiuchus, the serpent bearer, as well as the snake as he is handling, which is the constellation Serpents. And together, those constellations make up one of the largest star groupings in our skies. And uh, Serpents has the distinction of being the only constellation divided into two parts. Um, the two parts are Serpens Caput, which is the snake's head, um, off to the right here, and Serpens Cadua, the snake's tail, separated by the constellation of Ophiuchus. This myth has some echoes in the modern world. Uh, shown here is the caduceus, which is the symbol of the medical profession, and it depicts a staff, the staff of Asclepius, uh, with two snakes wrapped around it, recalling the legend in the time when Asclepius raised the Prince of Crete from the dead. There's another interesting fact about the constellation of Ophiuchus. It is the 13th constellation of the zodiac. If you take a look in our view of the southern sky here, uh, we will see that there is a yellow line that crosses several constellations from the west to the southeast. That line is called the ecliptic, and it marks the, the apparent path of the sun uh, through the constellations. Uh, as the Earth orbits around the sun, the sun appears to move through the constellations, one each month, uh, until it cycles back after a year. And so the sun, the moon, and all the planets appear to stay very close to this line in the constellations in the nighttime sky. And there are 12 constellations uh, that span that path, and they are known as the constellations of the zodiac. But if you take a look, the ecliptic only passes through a very small portion of the constellation of Scorpius and spends a much longer time in the constellation of Ophiuchus. And that means that there are times when you'll be able to see uh, the moon, the planets, in the constellation of Ophiuchus, which makes it the unofficial 13th constellation of the zodiac. The constellation of Serpens Caput, uh, the head of the snake that Ophiuchus is holding, contains one of the best deep sky objects in the late spring, early summer sky. Just south of the brightest star in that constellation, a star called Unical High, uh, is the very bright globular cluster M5, or Messier 5. M5 was discovered by the German astronomer Gottfried Kirk in the year 1702, and independently rediscovered by the French comet hunter Charles Messier in 1764. It is a globular cluster, a cluster of between a half a million and a million very ancient stars, some of the oldest stars known in our universe. And uh, one of the best ones visible uh, for small telescopes uh, from here in New Jersey. It's generally acknowledged that uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, the best globular cluster is Messier 13, but M5 is a very close second. Well, over the past few months here at Sky Views, we haven't had much to say about the planets, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the planets are now all grouped in the morning sky, not the evening sky, so there are none visible after sunset. Uh, but if you're an early riser, there's a very interesting event to go and view on the morning of June 24th. Uh, you will need probably a pair of binoculars and a very low eastern horizon. As you can see in our view here, we're looking towards the southeast, 
Um, the sun is beginning to lighten up the sky uh, in the northeast. And uh, it's about uh, just after five o'clock, which is about a half hour before sunrise. And you can see all of the visible planets uh, that are visible to the unaided eye in our view here. Uh, that's not all that unusual that you see a group of planets like this spread out over about 107 degrees of sky from just above the horizon to just above the meridian. Um, but what is unusual is that all the planets are grouped in the order that they uh, occupy in the solar system, starting very low in the northeastern sky here. Uh, just before sunrise, you'll be able to see the planet Mercury. You will probably need a pair of binoculars to pick it out, but it's bright enough to be visible even in a small pair of binoculars. Uh, next up is the planet Venus, which you won't need any optical aid to see. Uh, the Venus is the second brightest object in the night sky, uh, with the exception of the moon. Next up, filling in for the location of Earth is our moon, uh, which is a crescent on the morning of uh, June 24th. Then the planet Mars, fairly dim, but much higher up and easy to see. The planet Jupiter, very bright and way off to the west, just past the meridian, the planet Saturn. A kind of unusual statistical occurrence that the planets are all grouped together in the sky at the same time and in the order that they exist from the sun. The last time this occurred was 100 years ago and it won't occur again until 2041. So if it's clear on the morning of June 24th and you're an early riser and you have a good low eastern horizon, get out and take a look at the planets. Well, that's it for sky views for June. Hopefully the weather will be clear and you'll get out to be able to view some of the sites that we talked about this month. Till next month, from everyone here at the New Jersey State Museum Planetarium, Clear skies.